Welcome to 123 from District 123, a podcast that explores and shares the magic happening throughout District 123 schools every day. In each episode, we chat with the people responsible for moving inspired educational ideas from the imagination to the classroom. We dig deeper into those ideas and share the successes from some of the most innovative practices seen throughout Oak Lawn Hometown School District 123. 123 from District 123 is proudly brought to you by the District 123 Ed Foundation. More information about the foundation can be found at d 123 edfoundationorg Now here's your host, District 123 Superintendent, Dr. Paul Enderly. Well, hello everyone and welcome to 123 from District 123. My name is Paul Enderly. I'm the proud superintendent here of Oakland Hometown School District 123. Uh, today we're very excited to uh, spend some time in a little bit of a deeper conversation regarding a topic that's very important to us here in District 123 because this is a topic that touches every student, every family, every child, every day here in our school system, and that's the, the work we do with curriculum. And I'm, uh, you know, very proud today to have uh, joining me in our podcast, Dr. Kathy Gavin, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction, and Family Engagement here in District 123. So Kathy, welcome, and why don't you uh, take a moment and introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, as Dr. Enderley said, I am the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum, Instruction, and Family Engagement. This is my seventh year in the district. I spent the first 26 years of my career at the high school level, and I'm very proud to come back to the district that formed me. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Oakland Hometown 123, and uh, basically my experience in every single grade level from kindergarten through eighth grade in this district is the reason why I went into education. I started my career teaching students math and I'm, I'm proud to be back here. That's excellent. We're, we're very proud to have you and glad to have had you to serve in this capacity, this leadership capacity over a number of years. And I know having the um, you know, some might say, well, you know, going from high school to elementary or elementary to high school is this major, major jump. And really, through the lens of curriculum, it isn't. But it does provide you a perspective of kind of knowing what those high school intended outcomes are right. to really be able to articulate our curriculum from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade to really get our kids prepared and ready for that high school experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really excited to um, be be here at the elementary level because it's given me a perspective that I never really had or appreciated the complexity of what our elementary teachers do every single day. And so as much as possible, I try to share with my colleagues at the high school level just how complex and difficult their job is. But um, it's uh, it's ex an ex exciting time in, in District 123 in terms of curriculum. So happy to talk about it today. D teaching those uh, those formative years and mm -hmm. um, uh, getting our students to not only have a very strong foundational base in literacy and mathematics, but also, you know, as our students become older in our elementary system, giving them access to some of these exploratory options right. are, are more and more important in, in, prep, in really truly preparing our kids to love learning, but to understand that there there is a sequential pattern and there's, there's things they need to do at the younger levels to help prepare them for the older levels. But uh, today we want to talk a little bit about um, how we we, the, the process we use here in District 123 to make sure that the work we do in curriculum is renewed, it's ongoing, mm -hmm. it's current, that it, uh, it seeks to um, provide opportunities for voice and for feedback from our students, from our staff, and even from our families. The, the, you know, curriculum is something that touches every one of us every single day. So it's an area of great importance. And I know we put a significant amount of leadership time and effort and resources into what we put in front of our students and staff every day mm -hmm. um, to make sure that teaching and learning occur at a very high level. So that, that being said, that's kind of our big idea. Our, mm -hmm. our one, two, three podcast is formatted as such. One big idea, today's is curriculum renewal, two corresponding mm -hmm 
concepts mm -hmm. that support that big idea. So we'll be talking about two specific things relative to our curriculum renewal pro process. And then the three stands for three potential outcomes okay. or um, new ideas that kind of build off this, this mm -hmm. concept of curriculum renewal. So um, just to talk and to kind of set the, the stage for our conversation today, Kathy, um, our big idea is this idea of, you know, how do we foster continual improvement uh, in the area of curriculum? Um, as such, uh, through your leadership, we've adopted this, what we call curriculum renewal cycle right. as a means to plan kind of long-term curricular adjustments and adoptions in an attempt to make sure that our students and staff and our entire school community has access to the most research-based and the mm -hmm. most current curricular resources to ensure viability, strength, to make sure all of our students, you know, we have five elementary schools mm -hmm. that feed into one middle school. We want to make sure all of our elementary school students have a guaranteed experience. And that experience is consistent, it's rigorous, but it's also engaging mm -hmm. to them each and every day. Um, as you know, as state level and federal mandates uh, connected to curriculum increase, changes of these tools are, are necessary Absolutely. and are necessary to be ongoing. Uh, we hope to use this model of renewal and this cycle to make sure that uh, we keep the process regular and we, we always analyze, we develop, we implement, and mm -hmm. then ultimately ev we evaluate right. the work we do on an ongoing um, basis across all of our disciplines, which, you know, as you know, it, it adds to the complexity and challenge of uh, what we do. But this process helps us to consistently review mm -hmm. good things and, and to make sure that, that our students are absolutely getting the best uh, on a regular basis. So that being said, um, that is our big idea, the, the okay. idea of curriculum and renewal. And let's talk a little bit um, let's, let's just take it down to its basic parts. Okay. You know, if we could, uh, Kathy, if you could share with our audience mm -hmm. a little bit about just simply what is curriculum? What is instruction? What is ass assessment? How are they each uniquely different? Mm -hmm. But how do they all work together in synergy to make learning come alive for our students? Okay. Well, you know, I like to think of curriculum as the roadmap. You talked about the outcomes. You know, what are those big ideas that we want students to know and be able to do at the end of the year across all different content areas? And so that's how I, I think of uh, curriculum. And it's very important that we ground those outcomes in the standards, whether they be national standards or state standards. And then I think of instruction almost as the bridge. You know, that's where the um, we talk about the art and the science of teaching occurs. You know, instruction is how do those outcomes live every day in our classrooms. That's where the magic happens in our classrooms. So that's where the teachers develop lessons, activities, projects, opportunities for students to engage in those outcomes. And then the assessment is really, how do we measure whether or not those outcomes have been achieved? So all three components are really important when we talk about curriculum renewal. Absolutely. So would it be safe to say if, if you and I were fourth grade teachers, teachers teaching a math lesson mm -hmm. um, in District 123, whether we were at the same school or different schools, we would have a roadmap. We would have a Absolutely. curriculum. We right. would have outcomes that we intend to accomplish through our instruction. Yes. And those would be the same. Right. Throughout the district. So, so our kids in fourth grade would be getting a very similar experience. Mm -hmm. However, the how Absolutely. The, the, the way, the manner in which I approach a, a lesson mm -hmm. may be very similar to yours, or it could be very different. Right. So, so right. The, the, the freedom then, uh, relative to the how, mm -hmm. the instructional components are kind of delegated onto the teacher to leverage their strengths, their knowledge, their background as instructional specialists right. to deliver that curriculum and make it understandable and digestible for our students. Absolutely. It's really important that our students uh, make sense of those outcomes and uh, make connections, not only within a discipline, but across discipline. And I think, you know, 
the um, activities and the lessons that our teachers develop really is grounded in um, the relational aspect, the social aspect sure. of learning, because uh, it's really important. You know, you can have a, a great roadmap, but you have to be able to connect with the students. And I think that's where the magic happens and the art of teaching happens. Sure. Um, so, yeah, yeah, very important. Yeah. So, so the, the roadmap or the curriculum uh, gives us our what, what we what we teach, what we right. intend to teach. The, the 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 teachers then have autonomy over the how mm -hmm. they go about, you know, instructing students and leveraging right. their strengths and their experience and their knowledge to convey that information the best way they can. Mm -hmm. And then it, it kind of goes back to consistency with the assessments. So then the right. assessments are used to measure exactly how well the students performed on those on that roadmap. Absolutely. And I think when we talk about assessment, you know, we have our formal assessments such as our IAR, for example, Illinois Assessment of Readiness. That is our, our state mandated assessment that's given to all students in grades three through eight. We also here in District 123 administer the MAP assessment, which is a, a national assessment, as you know, three times a year, yep. which also is another measure of how our students are doing. But I think when we talk about assessment, we also have to talk about about informal or formative assessment as well. Sure. You know, that's the day-to-day -day, um, uh, opportunity for, for teachers to kind of uh, take a temperature check. How well are students doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And, you know, with that, that temperature check, providing feedback so that students know, okay, here's what knowledge, skills they're secure with, and here's where we maybe need to do some more sure. work, sure. shore up some opportunities for those students to master those skills and outcomes. So, so even in the area of assessment, this, this final piece, there are, there are smaller checkpoints. Absolutely. The, these formative pieces along the way that allow teachers and students and sometimes families when those assessments are brought home to kind of demonstrate where kids are in the process. And then at the end of a learning experience, at the end mm -hmm. of the unit, at uh, each spring when we do state testing or mm -hmm. after, after every trimester as we do MAP testing, these more summative measures provide us a greater idea of how our kids are performing and like some of those big ideas, those reporting standards. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's important when we talk about mastery of outcomes, we want to make certain that students can um, apply their knowledge and transfer that knowledge to unique situations. So. Yes. Okay, very yeah. good. Um, so we learned a little bit about what curriculum instruction and assessment is, how mm -hmm. they are different, but yet how they work in synergy uh, with one another. Um, can you share uh, one current example of how curriculum renewal works here in District 123? Okay. Well, I think <clears throat> the most immediate thing that comes to my mind is um, we are in the process of um, preparing for a pilot um, in mathematics for next school year. So when we talk about that curriculum renewal cycle, you know, we've done a lot of work um, analyzing our current curriculum, you know, and current outcomes, identifying, you know, what are those really big ideas? What, where are the gaps that we're seeing? Right now we use a resource at the K-5 level, and then we use a different curricular resource at the 6-8 level. And, you know, I'm going to stop myself right there because we, I think that's a really important distinction to make between a curricular resource and then the actual curriculum. So the curriculum that are those outcomes, those big ideas, but the curricular resource is how, um, teachers um, help deliver that instruction. So those are uh, tools that are at their disposal to help make those outcomes come alive. So um, we have, we've analyzed our, our current curriculum and for example, at the K-5 level, we use Eureka um, for our core concepts in mathematics. But over the last several years, teachers and uh, math facilitators have done a lot of supplementing of that curriculum to embed the fluency and the problem solving components, sure. which are really critical um, when we talk about the standards yeah. in mathematics. So um, what we are doing right now is trying to take a look at a set of criteria based on our experience um, with our current resource, based on our understanding of the standards, based on how we've operationalized those standards in the district, developed a set of criteria to look at 
you know, what are those um, essential components of a curricular resource that we would um, need to see before we would even consider a possible resource for um pilot. Sure. So that's where we're at right now. We're okay. looking at five different resources. We're looking at evidence of that criteria across those five resources. And then next year, we will um, distill the five that we have landed on right now down to two. We will pilot and then get ready for that um, implementation stage of curriculum renewal, whereby we would provide that professional development for the teachers. Um, and I really think, you know, that implement stage really takes a good seven years, be, sure. you know, to make sure that you have to live a curriculum um, adoption for at least three to four years before you can um, really see, you know, uh, how, how do we streamline it? How do we really make it ours? And then, um, and then ultimately evaluate. So right now, um, you know, to give another example, as I said earlier, it's a, an exciting time in terms of curriculum renewal in this district. And uh, we are in the middle of piloting two resources for uh, K-5 English language arts. So um, yeah, yeah lots, lots going on in terms of curriculum. So, so in, 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 in regards to a cycle, yes, the, 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 this ongoing, um, continuous cycle of improvement where we we implement, yes, we you know after a number of years we analyze, mm -hmm. and and you know you you went into detail about how uh, how much we do analyze. Yes, you know, I we, think we that's look, a critical. We look at data, we look at research, we mm -hmm. look at resources. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and after we, you know, analyze, then you know, ultimately we seek to evaluate you right. know, the work we do. So these ongoing cycles of implementation, analysis, evaluation mm -hmm. are ongoing. And depending on the discipline, so you spoke specifically to what we're presently doing in math, but we have cycles that are right. occurring in <clears throat> social studies, Absolutely. in music, in science, in reading, and these cycles are ongoing. And Every discipline is maybe on a little bit of a different timetable. Absolutely. Because we can't bite all of this off in one no. One 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 year. In a sense. <laughs> you know, sometimes as impatient as we are sure. and as excited as we are, we would like to, but we do have to consider budgetary uh, constraints as well as making certain that we're not putting too much on teachers' plates and trying yeah. to implement at the same time. Yeah. But that evaluation piece, I think, is really critical, and the evaluation piece is what led us to um, accelerating the timeline for our K five uh, curricular. Um, ELA development. Sure. So we, you know, looked at um, our standardized test scores. We um, sought the feedback of teachers. Um, we've sought feedback from uh, family. You know, through our curriculum council, um, we also looked at you know where the the gaps were, and so that is what prompted us to. Um, start that development phase of the ELA sure. curriculum development. Sure. That's right. what led us to where we're at right now. Well, thank you. Let's circle back to our, our process. We were discussing this one big idea of curriculum right. renewal. We talked a little bit about what curriculum is, what it isn't, mm -hmm. how it's connected to instruction and assessment. We've given an example of how curriculum renewal works here mm -hmm. in District 123. Let's jump down to the three in 123 and talk about three some, some outcomes, some new ideas that have um, been produced from mm -hmm. curriculum renewal. And one key outcome of our District 123 strategic plan is to ensure that each student here in our school system every day will master foundational skills in reading and mathematics. And mm -hmm. for, for an elementary school district, that's crucial. Mm -hmm. You know, every elementary school district there is in the nation has that as a primary and key goal. Absolutely. How does curriculum renewal fit into this idea of foundational skills? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, going back to what we're currently doing right now with our uh, K-5 ELA curriculum, when we evaluated the curriculum, we looked at the Common Core Standards, we saw a few years ago that there was a gap in terms of those foundational skills that are mentioned in the Common Core, but making certain that our curriculum was intentional about infusing um, 
you know, explicit phonics instruction. Sure. So that um, led us to the adoption of foundations, and that's the resource that we use to do that explicit phonics instruction now at the K through two level. Okay. And so there's an example of those. Um, really critical foundational skills that we're missing. And so we've made certain when we evaluated in the curriculum renewal cycle, we embedded that in the curriculum development of our K-5 ELA uh, literacy block. So okay. foundational skills is a, a key component. Okay. So so in that example, <clears throat> we, we saw some gaps relative to some of our our youngest students in the primary right. grades, K-1-2, right. who were really not... Um, performing phonetically right. at a level that we, we saw acceptable. And as such, we made a change Absolutely. to try to boost that up a little bit and, right. and build that into curriculum mm -hmm. adoption as we look, we sought out different ways to adopt literacy curriculum Absolutely. for our primary students. And then the same thing would probably take place in mathematics too. Right. If we identified that um, at a certain grade level that our, our fifth graders were, were, were seeing performance, let's say in um, problem solving, mm -hmm. not be at levels that we were acceptable to us, we would then seek within the renewal cycle to build in co curricular components to make that problem solving approach different or changed or adopted in a different way. Right, right. Because, okay. you know, when you look at the curriculum standards, like, uh, for example, in the, the common, common core standards in mathematics, you know, it, it can be overwhelming because there is there is a lot. And so any district has to look at operationalizing those, unpacking those, and distilling from that what are those big essential ideas that we want to make certain are covered. Because it's, it's impossible, really, to cover all of the standards. Sure. So, you sure. have to really identify the priority standards, yeah, absolutely. you know, and I think um, especially coming through the pandemic now, we've really tried to focus on what are those priority standards that we want to make certain that um, are are covered, assessed, and mastered ultimately by our students. So so the process itself, although very complex and yes. time consuming, it is very responsive. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And that, that, that evaluatory opportunity, that analysis opportunity provides us a built-in regular um, check right? Uh, to check, in a sense, the health of our entire system. Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Very, very good. You know, another aim of our school district is to make sure that at the classroom level, all of our students... Um, again, from our, from our youngest students in kindergarten to our older students in seventh and eighth grade, that they are challenged right. at their level. Right. Um, what you know? What are the steps infused to in, to guarantee that this aim is accomplished? That that you know you have your class of twenty five or thirty students, and that you know students you know come in at different um, ability levels with different experiences, mm -hmm. different skill sets, different strengths, and right. areas where they need to improve. How does the curriculum renewal process kind of keep that priority at hand? Well, I think, you know, differentiation is, is um, a challenge oftentimes, and uh, especially when we see diverse levels in a classroom. So when we seek to adopt new curricular resource materials, one of those criteria that we're looking at are the supports that are available for the teacher to either enrich or remediate. So we want to make certain that um, those those things are embedded in a, a curricular resource. So as an example, um, and, and also the standards also give us a way to help us um, identify ways to enrich or challenge students appropriately. Because with every standard, there's a verb. And the verb is the action that the yeah. students are expected to um, to enact to show mastery. So that verb, I think, is really critical in terms of helping to enrich and challenge students. Um, and so... Uh, embedded with enrichment, we have to make sure that we have resources available, but also allow the teachers for their creativity as well to help, um, you know, uh, students, you know, reach their potential. We also um, have different tools available, s such as IXL, that uh, provides an individualized learning platform for students to access at home 24 hours a day if they want to and, and go on a path to enrich um, and deepen their skills and understanding. You, you mentioned earlier in our conversation the um, 
the the aspect of transfer. Yes. Making sure that that students can take what they're learning in the classroom and transfer it to other contexts. Right. And, and how that plays into this idea of challenge and mm-hmm. making sure kids are challenged. You know, ki- kids might be studying uh, a novel mm-hmm. at the sixth grade level. We're really not teaching the novel no. to the students. We're teaching some standards such as maybe finding main point right. or character analysis or right. understanding the setting of a story so that when they when our kids leave that classroom experience or exit from learning about that novel, they could pick up another book. Right. They could pick up a newspaper. They right. could read something off uh, the internet and be able to apply those standards to another context. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's making me think of last Thursday, I had the opportunity to go around and visit some of our classrooms that are piloting the new um, CKLA ELA resource. And uh, the... Uh, uh, author of CKLA is Amplify, and Amplify is also uh, the author of our, our new science curricular resource at the K-5 level. So to visit these classrooms and see the students naturally making connections between the disciplines, using academic vocabulary, seeing the connections between what they're learning in science and as well as English language arts was really, really exciting. So, you know, as we're... Um, Embarking on this curriculum renewal cycle, solidifying our curricular resources, I think this next stage will help us make you know, even stronger connections between the disciplines, because I think to the extent that we make those connections, yeah. um, students make those connections, they're really going to... Um, to learn sure. and, and master concepts and skills. So the last, the last outcome I want to talk a little bit about that we, we haven't really dappled in yet, but we could, we could have our own podcast on this topic, but yes. it's just this idea that, you know, the materials that we put in front of our kids, the materials that our teachers use to teach and, and get our kids to learn every day, they have to be inspiring and engaging to the student. Absolutely. And, and they have to help our, our, our teachers leverage their strengths. Right. Um, uh, instructionally. Right. To, to be able to really motivate and, and be authentic and meaningful for our students. Mm-hmm. So as we're evaluating curricular tools, you know, how, how do we ensure that the things that we're putting in front of our kids mm-hmm. and the things that we make budgetary and fiscal commitments to for, as you said, it could be anywhere from five to eight years, right. are materials that do engage the learners? Right. You know, I think, you know, we were talking about um, assessment before. And obviously, you know, you want to look at measuring the outcomes, what you want your students to know and be able to do. But I think that qualitative piece of um, evaluating curricular resources is really, really important. Um, Visiting classrooms, listening to students, listening to teachers, listening to families. You know, uh, one of the things I ask uh, our families that visit the Curriculum Council is tell me, you know, what do your students, for example, we have a new social studies curriculum. What do your students come come home excited to talk about in terms of what they've learned in social studies. And one of the um, criteria that we use to adopt a new curricular resource for social studies is that um, it had to make certain that there was abilities for teachers to access inquiry. Um, And what I mean by that is inquiry is at the heart of those new social studies standards. We want students to be naturally curious, not just learn civics and geography and history like we probably were Uh, learned that back in the day, but be able to apply that and take informed action so that they can be active citizens in our society. And so that that notion of inquiry and um, resources to help teachers infuse inquiry um, and help students engage with that is is really critical. So those qualitative pieces are are essential in in evaluating a curriculum because we can't just look at numbers and assessment results. Results, but we have to talk to the people, um, I think, at the ground level. And students will be really honest with us, and they will tell us what they like and what they don't like. So I, I think we have to leverage students' voices. Yeah. That's really important. And I'm always amazed at the curiosity of our students mm-hmm. here in District 123. You walk in any classroom um, across mm-hmm. our district, and you see hands in the air. You yes. see uh, 
precocious students who are asking questions. Absolutely. And I think, I think that helps us too when we take a more inquiry-based approach right. uh, to investigate a significant question because mm-hmm. I think it's human nature to be curious about things. And right. we, we want to harness that. We want to make, yeah, I, I feel like that's a, a, a foundation of making learning authentic and meaningful is right. that when you could really harness the curiosity of our learners mm-hmm. in, in, a, in, a, in a strong way. And I feel like that level of inquiry kind of exists across all disciplines, mm-hmm. you know, as I walk and as I go into classrooms and visit with students and teachers, it seems like that is a theme that I see across our system. Right. Absolutely. Very good. Well, Dr. Gavin, thank you. Well, I thank appreciate you. <laughs> you taking the time to share some of your perspective, your insights, and your knowledge on curriculum and curriculum renewal here uh, in District 123. Uh, it was an engaging conversation and one thank that's you. very important to us here in School District 123. So that being said, I would like to uh, thank our audience uh, for uh, listening to our, our podcast today on curriculum renewal. Um, we always appreciate uh, those who are taking the time to, to listen. We use this podcast uh, approach and methodology in order to kind of get a little bit deeper Mm -hmm. on a singular topic because there are a lot of things in education that are are complex Mm -hmm. and uh, can't be said in a single statement or a report but really need to be discussed and talked through a little bit. So I want to thank our audience for listening to 123 from District 123. So until next time, remember when we believe our kids succeed.